Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God made. He said to the woman, did you actually, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of any fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end amen amen thanks brad and thank you for indulging me you know the interesting thing about this you know that that tune right there um, I, if you grew up in a certain different, there's a few, but in a certain traditions, that song will probably be rooted in the back of your brain. It is in mine. And, and um, I think, you know, sometimes having words with tunes hit you when you're 30 years down the line, maybe, is healthy and good for the soul. So I, I think these are some of the important things that we need to think about. Now in here, this is, this is personally, I'm just going to share where it says, let's see, where it says sermon in, in the little paper. It says God speaks to us. Now, this is one of the challenging things for someone like me. I, in the old traditional style, some of you may be familiar with, you know, pastor will wear a robe. The reason for that is to hide the man. It's supposed to be a humbling thing, right? If only it were more often. I will confess, it, it often isn't as humbling as I wish it were. Um, when I realize this is supposed to be a time where God speaks to all of us, myself included. I have a friend who, um, when he is, when he, he's a pastor, when he thinks of that reality, he, he's literally sick every Sunday morning when he considers the reality that he is a mouthpiece for the living God. And, and I, I envy him sometimes, um, when I think about it. So this is what we think we're doing here. God is speaking to all of us, myself included, and I think that's really important for for us to all keep in mind. He didn't make the slideshow, but but he's working in this this moment while we do this. Um, Real quick, though, I want to make sure we all know that in about three weeks, November 18th, we're going to have another meal at Myrie. We missed this last year. Um, we do, generally we'll do a Thanksgiving meal and we'll host it and we'll serve the community down in the Myrie cafeteria and we're going to do that again this year, November 18th. There's a sign-up sheet. You can actually go in the app and hit Myrie Meal. You can sign up if you'd like to help volunteer for that. 
Um, this series, I'm starting a new series today, The Mission of God. What is God doing? That's the question I was wrestling with. Um, and as I think about that, I, I, I think, you know, there are people that I know who have, have rejected God, rejected His mission, said, nope, I don't want anything to do with that. And honestly, when I have conversations, I don't think they really know what at least this says that God is up to in the world. Like, what's he really doing? And if, to be completely fair, I know there's a lot of people who say, yep, I'm on board, I'm going where God's going, and I don't think they know either sometimes, right, um, where, what God is doing and, and where he's going. What is his purpose? What is his mission? What is he about? And, and this has helped, you know, I had a conversation um, about this. And, and sometimes people say, you know, when I hear the word mission, I think of, for instance, Gemo. You know, we've got a Gemo partnership in Addis Ababa. Um, we think that is a mission. Or Myri, you know, we want to partner, we want to serve the community down there. That is a mission. And, and that's fair. We do use that language that way. But when we talk about the mission of God, it's bigger Right. If you think in battle terms, if you're into you know military tactics and strategies, right, the the military might have a a, a a strategy which is a big plan, and then they have tactics. Well, Myri, Gemo, these things they're tactics. They're not the big vision, the big plan, what God is about. So when we talk about the mission of God, we're talking about big picture. And I actually put an image of an iceberg on there because I think sometimes when we think about it. We see the, the tip, and we don't realize there's a lot more going on under the surface that we haven't considered or thought about or, 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 or been aware of. And so for a few weeks, we're going to be rethinking and talking about God's mission. What's he really up to in the world? Now, first, I want to remind us of a couple of themes in the, in the Genesis creation story, um, which Brad read a little bit, and actually that was bit of the fall story, but it all takes place in that early first three chapters of Genesis. few themes that pop up, though, from early on. The first, I'm going to read to you from Genesis 1, 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the earth, over the, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In the early stages, before this, before the fall, in the early stages, God intended humanity, that's us, to multiply and to have dominion. Multiply speaks to, I think, relationship. It deals with, well, certainly, right, our intimate, most intimate relationships. It, 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 it speaks to our relationship with our family. And I think we can go from there and say it relate. It, talks about the way we relate to others. To multiply is to create more of us and to, to relate to more of us, right? It's about relationship. Multiply is about relationship. Dominion is about work. It's about what we do with our hands, about what we do with our hours, our days, our years. So multiply, relationship, dominion, work. These are the two things that we were created to do. And then there's another theme that pops up that the, the, the early humans were in some sort of intimate relationship with the God who had made them. I mean, we saw, we didn't see this in what we read, but earlier, God brings the animals before Adam to be named. He, God is participating with Adam in his work of dominion. There is, there is did you see that? He didn't just say, go do it. He joined him. In what Adam was called to do. There was, there's partnership and, and relationship in that. And we're told, and, and Brad did read this, that, that after the fall, after the man and woman chose, you know, we, we, we know better. We'll, we'll trust in, in ourselves instead of our maker. Um, it, they, they hid from him. They heard him coming. And that's the shocking part in the text, right? That, like when, when he reads that and he's, you know, they, we heard you coming in the garden and we were afraid and we hid. And that's, 
if we're the first time reading that, that's supposed to make us go, they hid? Like, that's not what we expect. Because we expect that there's a, a, a relationship. And so that's the other thing. We're led to believe that there's some sort of intimacy, a relationship between God and man. Let me see if this thing's work for me today. Relationship with God. Relationship with others. And maybe relationship with the world. These are the three things. And uh, just so you know, in the original PowerPoint, didn't transfer very well to our technology. There was arrows going. We have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with others. And we have a relationship with the world around us the world that we're made to inhabit. These three things were a part of our original design. So what's God up to in the world? What is he really doing? This is what we're going to think about over the next few weeks. But I want to look at the tip of the iceberg, (laughs) uh, what's most obvious. And that's what we need to think about today, is that These three things, right? This is what we were made for. Relationship with God, relationship with others, relationship with the world. Well, let's think. What got broken in the fall? What what got damaged when humanity chose to go their own way? Intimacy with God. What did they do? It's the first thing they did. They hid from him. Intimacy with each other. They covered themselves. They were ashamed in one another's presence. And they blamed each other. Adam's like, no, it's her fault, right? There's blame and shame. The relationship with others bit got damaged in work. The curse, God tells man, thorns, when you work the ground, when you seek to take dominion, and you're doing your farming, thorns are going to grow up out of the ground for you. So these are the things that got broken. First thing God is doing is fixing what is broken. And so what I want to look at today, after that long introduction, is Jesus. Who was, he's told, he's he's called in the New Testament, the second Adam. Meaning, first guy, Adam, got it wrong. Second guy, Jesus, does it right. So he gets right everything that Adam and subsequently all of us have messed up. And so I wanted to look at what, how these three things in particular, relationship with God, relationship with others, and relationship with the world, how those three things are redeemed or fixed in his life. So we're going to be looking at Luke 6, 12 through 19. I'll read it for us. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night, he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, He called his disciples and chose from them twelve who he named apostles, which in Greek means the sent ones, by the way. Um, Simon, whom he named Peter and Andrew, his brother, and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them. And stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out from him and he healed them all. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, would you be with us as we look at your story? your life and, and, and try to understand what it is that you and your Father are up to in our world. Help us to understand it so we might join it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so in that text, in that passage, we actually see these three things. And I, and I want to I see what Jesus does and how he interacts and how these things are redeemed. So look at what he does first. He spends time in prayer with his father. That's the top bit, right? I don't have the slide up now. But the relationship with God part, that's what he's doing all night long. 
It says all night long he prays. Now, some of us I know have been there, right? Maybe you're there right now. Good. It's fantastic. Good for you if you are. Um, some of us have probably maybe never done that. Some of us may be thinking, that sounds awfully hard. That sounds like a lot of work. Just praying all night long, what would you say, right? I, I get it. I get it. I think one of the reasons that we sometimes wrestle with this, I have a theory anyway, is that we don't always experience how deeply we need relationship with God. That first thing got messed up. We have our famous, what I call porcelain prayers. Oh, God, help me, I'll never do that again, right? Some of us know that prayer. Um, you know, diagnosis prayers. Some of us have prayed those. Suddenly we, we, we get this need, this urge, and, and it's like I'm, I'm desperate, and, and we cry out to God, and that is good because we know our need. Somebody sent me a joke. Um, this week or last, <laughs> uh, this guy's driving down the road. He's late for a meeting. He's driving. He's looking for a parking place, and, and, and he starts praying. He's like, Lord, please help me find a parking place. I will go to church every week. I'll give up the whiskey. I'll do whatever, you know, and then he sees a parking place. All of a sudden, he goes, oh, never mind. I just found one. <laughs> we can probably all relate a little bit to that story, <laughs> I think. I think some of that might be because we have been shaped, formed, trained, right? And all the things that we do shape, form, and train us, like we said earlier. I think maybe it's possible that we have been shaped somehow to believe in a God that's a little more like a fairy godmother than the king of all creation. That maybe something in what we've been taught or the way we've practiced our faith, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I can't put my finger on it, but that, that God, we've been taught to believe that God exists to aid us on our journey toward life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? That that's the real goal of life. And that he is there for us when those things don't seem to be working. And we don't really need him otherwise. As long as life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness are going well, I'm good. And I think that's what... Some of us know this, right? Some of us live this way. Well, what if our imagination of the good life, when we think, what is the good life... What if, instead of thinking, life, liberty, and sad, whatever, I'm not saying that's bad or necessarily it, but I think we, that's a general summary of what, what we're taught to be after. But what if our imagination of what really the good life is, is whole, healthy, great relationships with people around us and with the world that we live in? What if we saw our hurt, our anger, our bitterness, our pain, not as things to be fixed, to get over, right? But as things that we need God to walk with us through. I think if we saw the brokenness, the hurt, the pain in our lives... Less as something to just be taken away and more as something that we need God with us in. Maybe we'd need it more. Maybe we'd pray more. Maybe all night prayer sessions wouldn't feel like such a distant thing if we understood that what we really need is not to get better, but to have God. Jesus knew one thing in that moment, in that, that night that he needed his father. He wasn't looking for a solution. wasn't looking for answers. wasn't even looking for guidance. He was looking for his father to be loved, to have a deep relationship. That is what he wanted, and that is what he was doing there. Do you and I know that? 
do we sense that? Do we feel that? Or do we just want to be fixed? There is a relationship there that God is about healing. Not just our side of it, but our relationship with him. So then Jesus, look at what he does next. He goes from this all-night prayer session, he goes and he develops close relationships with other people. He chooses 12, and, and by the way, also, well, 9 and 3, right? Because there's 3 in particular in that group of 12 that we're told repeatedly in the stories that we have of Jesus and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're, we're told repeatedly that these three, Peter, James, and John, spend a lot more time with him. They seem closer to him than the other nine. In fact, that he's close to the nine. We see a lot of that. But, but he's particularly close to those three. He had close, intimate relationships with, with people who shared his vision, his hope, his dreams. And sometimes they understood him, and sometimes they didn't. There's a lot of times that these guys misunderstand. In fact, one time, everybody misunderstands Jesus, and they do too. And Jesus is like, you guys want to leave too? He's like, I don't know where else to go. You're the, yeah, nowhere else, Right? They didn't let the misunderstandings affect the relationship. Do you hear what I just said? I think we are in a deep need to hear that. All of us in, in, our, in our cultural moment that we all live in, I know a lot of us who have broken relationships based on misunderstandings. Jesus and his friends didn't let the relationship was more important than understanding one another. I wonder how we're doing that. Ask this question. Who are the people in your life? Who are the three? The three Jesus had these three close friends. Who are those three in your life? People who love you and you know they do who who you can be honest with right you can tell them what you're struggling with they're not going to condemn you they're not going to judge you they're not going to leave you if you tell them the truth they know and they love you and they know you that's the other thing they know you they they know what motivates you they know what drives you they know what you're passionate about they know what makes you laugh and they know what makes you cry i hope are you thinking of some people i hope you are and they tell you the truth. They're honest with you. They care about you enough to challenge you when you're wrong. Who are those people in your life? We're working this month, actually, no, we're not. Jim is working this month to grow our gospel communities. Um, working hard. And uh, you know, let me be honest, there are some pastors, and I, I, I'm around, and I see this, um, and I... I should, that, this is mean, don't mean it to be, but, but I feel it too, okay, so I get it, I get it, I get it, who want to have numbers and say, you know, we've got I don't know, 70 people in gospel communities or 80% of the church in gospel communities or whatever, I know for a fact that Jim and I, we don't care about that, we don't, what we care about is seeing every single person here have people in their life who love them, and who know them, and who tell them the truth. Who begin to redeem, restore what was broken in the fall, those relationships. Because we know two things, <laughs> with absolute certainty. That we were created for relationships. And that we struggle with them a lot. I mean, come on, guys. We're mostly German and Norwegian. Is that a surprise? We're the upper Midwesterners. Oh, I'm good. Thank you. That's our relationship. We need to grow in that area. Jesus models it. That's why we want our gospel communities to grow. Not so we can have status or check boxes, but so that we are people who have people in our life who know us and who love us and who tell us the truth. This is what God is doing in the world. He's redeeming that. And he's inviting us to be a part of it. Will we?
Finally, in this passage, we see Jesus working in the world. He goes out and he ministers to the crowds. That was his work in the world, ministering to crowds. But he was a man, just like us, and so he experienced the thorns that were promised in Genesis 3. Yeah, 3. It's like, wait, was that 4, 3? 3. He was betrayed. He was abandoned. He was falsely accused. I mean, for Pete's sake, he was murdered because of his work in the world. Talk about thorns, right? And as we see in our text, it says, power went out of him. It's interesting. Let me translate that for us. He was exhausted. Can you relate to that? Think about this. What is you in your head think, what is my work in the world? Maybe it's being a parent. That's talk about exhausting. I get it. Maybe you're maybe you're in sales, right? You, you know, do you have to make cold calls? Oh, bless you. I'm so sorry. I've had to do that. Talk about thorns. Man. That's that's tough. Maybe you just have to deal with grumpy customers. Maybe you're a, a doctor who's replaced the same joint five times. <laughs> maybe you're a teacher who cares deeply and passionately about the education of your students, and maybe you've got students who just don't care. Thorns. Me? I want to see people grow in their relationship with God, their relationship with others, in their relationship with the world. And... I struggle to grow in my relationship with God, my relationship with others. And I know we do. We all do. And, and so those are my frustrations. Those are my exhaustions. Those are my thorns. I struggle with it. I know you struggle with it. Are you exhausted when you think about your work in the world? Are you frustrated? Do you, do, you, do you go out and do it and feel like you lost ground today? Jesus shows us what to do in those moments. In fact, our values show us. Do you, do you remember seeing our little value triangle? These are the four values that we have at Bismarck Community Church. Gospel, relationship with God. Community, relationship with others. Mission, our relationship to the world. Now, what's interesting is that nearly every church that defines a mission statement that says these are, our, these are the things that we want to do um, has some variation of this. Uh, in fact, let me see. This is our mission statement spelled out. Understand the good news about Jesus Christ. We shorten that, right, to be loved. That's that's what that is. The more and more we get it, the more and more we'll feel that we're loved and accepted. To grow deeper in authentic community. Relationships with, with the world, with, with others. And to influence our world according to the kingdom of God. That's our mission statement. Be loved, go deeper, live it out. That's, that's what we're about. And, and like I said, almost every church has some variation of these three points maybe articulated differently or whatever, because that's what we're picking up on, the tip of the iceberg. This is what God is doing in the world, and we want to we join Him. Now, it's interesting. I still remember the meeting we were in, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, when um, it was Claudette, I asked her earlier if I could say her name, uh, who, who encouraged us in that meeting. I, ha I think I brought the word to ch on the third point, to change or maybe to shape our world according to the kingdom of God. I think was the language that I, I brought, and she pushed back, and I'm glad she did, and said, you know, we can't actually change it. We can't actually shape it, but we can do what we can do to influence our world. And probably at the time I was like, ah, I didn't get my way, quite honestly. But I'm, I'm really glad for that because that's what happens, isn't it? When we feel the exhaustion or the thorns that are, that are happening that are growing up, and the frustrations, and when we feel like we've lost ground that day, then we're frustrated. And so that's why, and I had arrows here, 
But that's why the arrow doesn't end at affluence our world. It's why it doesn't stop right there. Once we fail, and we will, once we're exhausted, once we're tired, once we've just had all we can take, we need to go back. (laughs) We need to go back to our relationship with God and say, Lord, help me. Fuel me. We are loved. And that's the cornerstone. I I heard, and I probably have, have, have said this before, but it's so worthwhile that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point it out again. We often, and this is part of the brokenness of our relationship with others and with the world, we often live like people who have an empty cup in our hands, and we go around to our relationship with other people and we say, hey, will you fill me up? And then we go out, right, to, don't we, to our work in the world and we, and we ask our work to give us meaning. To give us reputation, to give us status, to give us money, to give us, you know, fill my cup. That's what we do. That's how we engage with others and with the world and and in our design and in God's mission and what God is redeeming in all of our brokenness is he is is calling us to do what Jesus does. To come to him with that empty cup and let him fill our cup up. And then we enter into relationship with other people. And we say, here, let me, let me fill your cup a little bit. And then we go out to our wor- work in the world and we say, let me, let me pour out more of what I've been given. And then when that's empty, when we're frustrated and when we're exhausted and when power has gone out of us, we return to our Father. And we ask Him to fill us up. That's what he's up to. That's the tip of the iceberg. He's redeeming the brokenness of of the fall. Our relationship with him, our relationship with others, and our relationship with the world. But the starting point, the starting point for all of that is the gospel. That's where it begins and where it ends. And we can never lose sight of that. So if, if, you're, if you're talking to somebody this week and they're like, oh God, isn't he the guy that tells you what to do and what not to do? No! Feel free to push him. No, don't do that. No! He's the one who is fixing what is broken. We've got to get that right. We've got to get that in our heads. And he's the one who accepts us. He's the one who loves us in Christ unconditionally. And then he makes all things new. Now, we'll talk more in the coming weeks about some of the specifics of what that might look like in us and in the world. But spoiler alert, it's always coming back to the gospel. (laughs) Let me pray for us. Jesus, you are good to, to give us an option <laughs> to participate with you in remaking all that is broken in this world. I thank you that you are doing that. I thank you that you, by your grace, you have forgiven us for the times that we fail and, and, and still do, and drawing us ever closer to you, which will then heal us, our hearts, and our relationships, and our world. God, would you continue to work in us and among us, and teach us, Lord, to, to pray, really, teach us to pray, whatever that might look like, and whatever that might mean, to, so that we might grow deeper in relationship with you. Thank you that you've given us this model. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed.